just minimize that and then move this. Okay, so my name is Brian Cornet. Um, my project is on optical character recognition and correction for images of digital displays. What is the deal? What is that? The basic idea is that I want to be able to collect data from images. A lot of times, if you have an image, you have access to the data or the information specifically that's contained within it, but you don't have it in kind of a digital format. Like for instance, right here, we have all this information. It's printed out in various numbers and letters and everything. But we don't have it in an actual string or numeric format like a table, so we can't operate on it. And I mean, this example took me a few minutes to type. And if I was going to do this for many entries, then it will take a while. So hopefully, there's a better way. And the idea is that, yes, if we use optical characterization, there is. Uh, so this is typically used in uh, a lot of things, such as uh, examining checks and uh, documents. If you haven't seen this before in your personal life, well, you will soon probably because it's very common. Uh, it typically relies on pattern recognition, but the idea is just generally trying to interpret letters or shapes or numbers, or whatever, into a actual character. Uh, this is actually very similar also to uh, what my classmate Marco Souza is going to be presenting in a few moments also, so stay tuned. Uh, now, this does rely on predictive modeling for machine learning, and if Machine can't, or human can't read it. Chances are machine can't either. Uh, for example, right here, this is a uh, handwritten text. It's pretty hard to read. The OCR interpretation from it is right here. It's not quite so good. Actually, it's pretty close, but it's not good enough, really. Uh, you can see it's a pretty big difference between what's here and here. So there are some limitations to how well the model can perform. So the idea generally is to just say, OK, well, we take an image, and can we convert it into some sort of list? like here, or table, like here. This is the area of interest, and we just want to collect this. Not that there are some areas outside that we don't want to pick up, here and here and here and here and here and here, and then here and here and here and here. We also have, in the case of a picture of a digital display, other elements such as the border. In this case, it's the device. Here, we have not just the device itself, but the background, the TV, and the wall and such. So in order to do that, we also have to include methods for adjusting the camera images and correcting for any other kind of issues. Like here, we have the moray pattern, which is what happens if you take a picture of a picture or a digital display. How do we clean it up to go from here to here? The big process. We also need to consider that some displays or some images are particularly messy with unusual fonts or locations for everything. These can be kind of hard to read, even just as is as a human. I find this a little difficult to read or here where the uh, arrangement of different images is all over the place. We also have a lot of background elements to consider as well. We can see some bleed in from these little designs in the back that overwrite the letters here or the numbers. So the channel just cut out for us. As far as platforms, I'll primarily use OpenCV and TestFact OCR. You can implement those in Python. OpenCV is the CV2 library and Tesseract is the PyTesseract library. More importantly, um, I just wanted to thank every professor who I've ever had over the last four years, including some of which from uh, UMass Dartmouth, but also some from Cape Cod Community College. Uh, if you're in this meeting right now, then I'm glad to acknowledge you, and I hope you can uh, appreciate everything that I've done here. So uh, let's look at Tesseract OCR. Generally, we can see that it outputs things as a page, but we can also break this down into a word-based location, and when we record something, it actually shows us not just the word that it picked up, but the coordinates for that same word as well. And we can use that to kind of map out where we're looking. Now, the interesting thing about this is that we can say that if we pick up the wrong word, but we still know where the location is, that is to say, if the interpretation is wrong, we can relook at an individual area and say, OK, well, maybe it's supposed to look like something else. We can do the same with a character as well. Maybe the character is wrong, but at least we have the right location. Uh, now, this test is pretty basic, so it was actually very accurate. There wasn't really a problem there. Although we can also see that there's kind of some boundary issues here. Obviously, nothing is this tall uh, where it says new. But otherwise, yes, it's very good. So the first test was on the Animal Crossing set, where we can see that if we tried to parse the entire table all in one, it doesn't quite work. We get the first and the last entry. Everything else in between is completely missed. 
but if we break it down to an individual item, perfect accuracy. Now, the reason for that is because this font is very easy to read and it's very high contrasting with a simple background. So it is just perfect for this kind of experiment. However, if we use the Monster Hunter data set, it doesn't quite work out so well because one, there's a lot of graininess there, probably from JPEG compression, as well as some bleeding from the background. You can kind of see some shapes back here. Uh, there's some bright text on dark backgrounds, which is actually the inverse of what we want. We want dark text on bright backgrounds, as well as bright text on bright backgrounds, which is even worse. The other issue is that this, since this is in a table structure, it's difficult for Tesseract to understand where we're actually looking. And worst of all is that we have a lot of symbols, which Tesseract also has trouble with. The uh, font itself is also kind of challenging. If you look at right here, where it says sheath sharpen, you can see that there's some bleeding between the H and the E, the A and the T, for example. There's a lot of that going on with this font. So a good font is very important. So if we look at image transformations, well, I, or quite a few of them. I'm just going to focus on the ones that I liked anyway. Um, one is binarization and thresholding. The idea is to break everything down into black and white exclusively. Um, typically, we apply a threshold there where we just say anything below a certain brightness value, we cut it off. And that involves uh, also grayscaling, I forgot to mention, I suppose, where we just kind of merge the red, green, and blue colors into one which is just a, you know, a black and white image typically, not truly black and white, but you know, that grayscale kind of black and white. Uh, we also have, here is a bitmap representation of everything. If we consider every pixel to be represented with 24 bits, which is eight for each color, that's 256 red values, 256 green, 256 blue, uh, we see that the most significant bits are typically the most relevant. So if we just ignore the lower significant bits, and even break it apart just into red, green, and blue, we can typically do a better job. Like for here, it turns out this bar, it says ammonite, was the reason why it wasn't parsing everything. Once we filter it into just red and green, perfect accuracy. We don't need to do anything else, which is great. We also have rotation skewing. Now, this is a big deal for anything with a camera image. Obviously, nobody is a perfect shot. There's never going to be a perfect aligned image. We do need to introduce this. Um, the idea in the matching experiment is to just look for the most common features between the images. This works out great if you have a template, like a blank uh, sheet of paper, like a form, and a comparative image to, you know, that's basically the base, and you can match up significant features. In this case, we have um, specific features that are already implemented from the base image to compare it to, and then we were able to transform it using those coordinates. It comes out pretty close. We do the same kind of rotation if we use canny edge detection right here. We have the original, that's the canny edge, where it just has um, basically a black and white interpretation of where all the edges are, or basically significant color changes. We do that, and then we apply another method that I created where we just look for the outermost edges of that canny edge to determine where the border is. Then we can apply the how lines, which will predict where the actual lines are. And we can kind of predict corners, such as here, 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 and here. And that will allow us to create rotation and match here. We can get Mr. Flamingo back where he belongs. And if all else fails, uh, at some point, we just have to do hand holding, which is where a human gets involved because it's not always easy to do this. This is typically more often the case where um, in this example image, well, I should, probably should have made it so much of a GIF, but we can see that the actual area of interest is on the right. And um, we can't just focus on that when so much of the image is also just some other graphical display. Uh, this is very common in a lot of video games where they'll just have a small window over something else, and we just care about the one little window. So without any real means of detecting that window, I mean, we do have those means, but um, I haven't figured them out just yet, uh, we will just rely on cropping them out. And once we do that, it's a lot easier. And then we can just you know, throw everything else in the trash. We also have noise removal, and this gets rid of the moray patterns and is very necessary for dealing with camera noise. Uh, even with very high resolution camera images, you're going to get noise. That's just the nature of camera imaging. Uh, but applying this, we can get rid of a lot of that noise, and we have a much clearer image. 
So that works out pretty well. We can also apply this optionally to any empty cells. If we are doing a parse and excuse me, we don't detect any text in a location that we know that there should be text, we can use this to kind of recheck the same location. And, uh, dictionary based text correction, I found this to be uh, more reliable typically. The idea is that if we parse the word, that is to say we detect where the location of the text is, well, the output is typically going to be a lot of nonsense. Like here it says Kirk Drow. That says Quit Draw, but that's clearly not what it says. This says Steehing. You know, they all say Steehing, Steehing, Sheeting is the correct one. They're all the same word, but because of this background element, they look different. Um, so the idea is that we compare all the results to all the possible results that could be in this column, or it could be a row, either way. Uh, by applying this, we actually improve the accuracy quite a bit. We go from 86% to about 93%. That's a pretty significant jump. or basically cutting the error rate in about half. Um, this is typically a lot better when we're dealing with longer strings, such as uh, names, uh, words, basically. When we're dealing with shapes, it's not quite as reliable since um, there's a lot of times where you'll just have two characters. And what's the difference between a plus 5 and a minus 5? In terms of distance, if you have 45 as your number, it's not, um, it's, it's the same distance, so it doesn't work out to be that well. Sorry again, to interrupt again. you, but you have yes. one minute remaining. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay, well then uh, I'll speed it up. We also have uh, Levenstein distance where we compare the items to the dictionary to see what are the closest matches. We can see that if we have a lower mean distance, that it's less likely that something will be confused or something else. And we can see that it's more likely to have a higher distance when we have uh, a much larger dictionary set, especially when a lot of items reuse the same words. Uh, we also have a character shape tiebreaker, where if we look at the image, or if we look at the font individually by character, we can compare the distances between those and go for the next best thing, especially if there is a unusual character involved, such as symbols. Conclusion. Uh, so the idea is that right now, it generally relies on hail holding. It's not fully autonomous. But we can improve that with more testing of different images, more refinement, and in the introduction of convolutional neural, neural networks, which I didn't get into, but I would like to. Um, and there were other features that I would like to add as well uh, for actual use of this, because I think it's a pretty nifty feature, but it's not really done. So that's it. Any questions? Have you explored any other edge detection methods, for example, Subel filter? Um, one of the other methods that I was using was a discrete wavelet transform to kind of, uh, let's see if I go back. I didn't have it here. Um, to kind of get an estimate for where those edges would be. Oops, I must have gone too far. No, I didn't explore uh, Sabelle filter since I was pretty satisfied with, um, I can't find it, with the uh, canny edge detection, but that is another method that um, was on my list. And like I said, there's a lot of things that I just, hadn't had the time to explore since there was a lot to consider. Thank you. Uh, any other questions for Brian, please? What were some of your favorite tools that you used during this project? I think generally, um, I think I preferred actually just when I was dealing with the binarization, splitting everything apart, I really enjoyed seeing how everything was uh, composed. Some of these digital images, especially when you had the clean ones, um, you can really kind of get a sense for how the graphical design for any of these images is done. Especially if you're looking at like an older image. Um, I didn't include it here, but there were some from, um, I go all the way back. This is an older game, so the uh, binarization for that is or the bitmap representation for it is a lot different than something that's newer like this, which is much uh, more vibrant. I guess Any to other? to riff on that question from Nathan, uh, what kind of programming language do you use for any of this? Right, I used Python to actually code everything, uh, but the platforms were OpenCV through the CV2 library and Tesseract OCR, which is an independent program, but you can interact with it through Python through the PyTesseract library. 
Uh, any other questions for Brian, please? Hi, uh, Brian. So I yes. have a quick question about the uh, results. So I, I, I see very uh, wonderful results. Uh, some of them are intermediate, some, some of them are final results, uh, but they're uh, about the qualitative results. I'm wondering if there's a way to quantify your results, say accuracy or any other metric. Yes, um, typically what I've been doing is I will take an experiment page and uh, write out the actual text as I can read it, because clearly I can just read this myself and type it out and then compare that with the output. And then I will apply the Levenstein distance, as I mentioned here, with the results individually cell by cell. And then I compare the average accuracy across each cell, or I can do column wise or row wise. And usually it's the case that if we consider just word accuracy, it's pretty good with the dictionary method. But if we were to look at uh, symbolic or numeric cases, it's uh, a lot worse. For example, here, these are not what they should be matching up to. It always defaulted to this value. Or here, where it missed a lot of the pluses and minuses or misinterpreted them entirely. I see, I see. But but this result is already very, very well. So great, great work. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, any further questions for Brian? If not, uh, let's thank our presenter. And uh, I'm moving down the schedule and looking for Jimmy McRae. Uh, right here. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. 